Hey friends, Ash here with Jensen. Hope you're doing well. Today I'm going to be talking to you guys about 10 different stunning fragrances that set the bar for other brands. So what do I mean by that? I mean, these are fragrances that when they came out, they were such a hit in one way or another that all the other brands had to take notice. They were like, oh, okay. So that's the game we're playing, huh? Dang it. Because these fragrances elevated things for the different niche or style that they were made in. And a whole bunch of these fragrances either directly inspired other ones that basically came out and just tried to rip them off, or they had every other brand scrambling to try to make something to compete with that fragrance in one way or another. So you could say that this is kind of a murderer's row of fragrances. And by murderer's row, of course, I don't mean that these fragrances it killed people. I mean, they were really good. Everybody knows what murderer's row means, right? Like, yeah. So let's jump into it. Let's check these out. Now I'm cheating once again, and I'm starting things off with a twofer. So it's two fragrances, but this only counts as one entry. And you'll see why. It's Dior Sauvage and Bleu de Chanel. These two fragrances right here, most people agree, is right there at the top. The top of the blue fragrance mountain. Sure, you've got some other heavy hitters like Yves Saint Laurent Y, or maybe Versace Dylan Blue, but still, at the end of the day, it's Dior, it's Chanel. Now, if I were gonna whittle these two down to just one, it'd be Bleu de Chanel, because this one came first. But Dior Sauvage gets knocked off just like Bleu de Chanel does nowadays. You could probably spend 10 minutes online looking up different versions or clones or inspired by fragrances of each one of these and come back with like 50 different things. So this one, Bleu de Chanel, has grapefruit, ginger, vetiver, and incense as some of the notes in the scent. I'd say between Bleu de Chanel and Dior Sauvage that Bleu de Chanel is the classier choice, but it's also a little bit more reserved than Dior Sauvage. Dior Sauvage is that bro who will not let you not notice him. You know, he's just, he's gotta be seen and heard and smelled. Sauvage has bergamot, ambroxan, pepper, and lavender. And I know it makes it sound like I'm kind of hating on Sauvage, but I'm not. I actually think it smells fan friggin' tastic. That's why so many people own that. Huge, huge, huge compliment puller. Last forever projects heavily, but Dior Sauvage and Bleu de Chanel, those two are at the top of the heap, the top of the mountain, as far as blue fragrances go. And those ones obviously set the bar that all the other designer companies are trying to follow. We're <laughs> trying to follow the bar trying to clear that bar, trying to go to the bar, because I had a rough day. Before we go any further, you know who's stunning to me? These fine gentlemen, the beast mo gents, that I just, I gotta, gotta mention these guys right here. These guys are awesome. If you would like to be awesome like them and join the membership program, click join below. There's also a link in the description. So thank you guys, back to the list. Next up, uh, another Dior. <laughs> yeah, and this one I'm, you know, I'm just throwing in here because I love it so much, but also because there are so many other companies that have come out with fragrances in this style. Dior Ohm Intense. Iris, Lavender, and Brett Pear and Cedar, some of the notes in this scent. And this thing is like an aphrodisiac. You just take the lid off, give it a smell. Ooh, it's so good. I talk about it all the time, but man, this stuff is just killer. Now, of course, originally there was uh, Dior Ohm before there can be an Intense. There must be the original, so there's, there's also that one. But Dior Ohm Intense, especially for me, is the one that just set it over the edge, you know, took it to the next level. The iris in there just outstanding. The way that it mixes with pear and ambrette. So of course you have lots of other fragrances that have come out since this one that are kind of doing a similar play on that iris, uh, like Gentleman Eau de Parfum, Valentino Womo Intense, fragrances like that. And those are those are great scents too, absolutely amazing. But Dior Homme Intense is the one that set the bar. Now let's go with a big date night hit. This is the original, it has been improved since this one came out, but this is still a modern classic. The one Eau de Toilette from Dolce & Gabbana. Ginger, amber, tobacco, cardamom, and grapefruit. Man, this is just about as perfect as a date night fragrance can get. And when this came out, everybody got their noses on it and it just blew up. You know that a lot of companies took notice. Now the big hitter on this one, you know, the thing that gets it a little bit of hate now and again, is the performance, which is not great, but 
as I have mentioned and everybody on planet Earth has mentioned, sometimes with the date night fragrance, you don't want something really loud. Nothing says sexy like a date who can't breathe because of your fragrance, because of your fragrance. So sometimes, you know, subtle is better. I know a lot of people are like, nah, man, all beast mode all the time. <laughs> But sometimes, sometimes you need to just a little bit of restraint. I mean, you don't need to be like driving your car and the speed limit is 15 and you're like 15, not for me. How about 120? I ride roller coasters without putting on the seatbelt. I just hang on. Now, I, I just said all that about the beast mode this, the beast mode that, and this next fragrance is really beast mode. So uh, Tom Ford Tuscan Leather. Now, technically this is a designer list, and Tom Ford is a designer. Now, I know some people think of the private blend as niche fragrances. <laughs> and depending on what suits my video for that day, it can be niche or designer. This one is one of the quintessential Tom Ford fragrances for me. I mean, if I had to give you like the top three fragrances that I immediately think of, if you say Tom Ford private blend, it's going to be Tuscan leather, tobacco, Benny, oud wood. Just boom, boom, boom. Those are the first three that pop into my mind. This one has been emulated or ripped off, if you want to call it that, countless times. This fragrance is one of those scents that, man, it spawned an entire category. And on top of all that, Tuscan leather gets name dropped in songs, it's in pop culture. It's, it's huge. So with Tuscan leather, that really just shows that these private line fragrances, not that they didn't before this, but this really helped drive it home, that those private line fragrances from designer houses can be both exclusive, you know, that air of exclusivity, but at the same time, be extremely mass appealing and last forever and choke people out. Let's go with another one that chokes people out. One million from Paco Rabanne. This, this, this is a club monster. Cinnamon leather, orange, amber, and grapefruit, some of the notes in this scent. And this one has that, that warm, sexy spiciness, that sweetness down to a T. It, of course, has the cheesy gold bar bottle. Paco Rabanne loves those cheesy bottles. Yeah, it's either love it or hate it, I feel like. With one million initially hated it, nowadays, I don't know, it's kind of grown on me. It's one of those things, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like a really ugly dog or something. And you know, look one of the hairless dogs and you see it and you're like, man, that's that's looking rough. Then over time, you're like, yeah, no, it's kind of it's kind of cute, maybe. It's like that bottle. Yeah, it's horrendously ugly, but at the same time, it's kind of cool. So this one really, really helped drive home that whole clubbing fragrance for a new generation. Black Excess from Paco Rabanne also came out before that and it was popular for a little bit. Also really well known for being a great clubbing kind of fragrance, very sweet, but one million took it over the top and really seemed to help cement Paco Rabanne as the house of overly freaking sweet fragrances, which some people love and other people hate. Let's kick it back a little bit. Let's go a little more old school. Azaro Pour Homme. This one came out in 78. This one has lavender. Of course, it's gotta have lavender, old school style, anise, oak moss, leather, and vetiver. That's some of the notes in the scent. This is a more vintage bottle, but I also have more modern ones as well. Stuff costs next to nothing. You can pick this up at discounters for probably $20 nowadays, maybe even less depending on the size of the bottle, but somewhere in that $20 range. It's a classic barbershop scent. Great, great, great quality for the price. Now that one obviously came out before I was born, but you can see the influence of that one as it carries through into the late seventies, early eighties, across a number of other fragrances that are done in a similar style. Not that this was the first one or anything, but it is one of the go-tos for so many people out there that are looking for just a, a classy, gentlemanly, sophisticated barbershoppy type scent that's not gonna run you all that much. And frankly, I just wanted to include it. Now, this next one needs no introduction. It's Aqua de Joe. Citrus, sea notes, musk, woods, florals, white florals, you know the drill. This is the best-selling men's fragrance of all time. You've got this same DNA being tweaked and changed and re-released as new flankers like Profundo or Profumo or Profundo Lights, and those do well also. And yet they still can't outsell this one. Now, when this fragrance dropped, if it was before your time, 
it was literally everywhere. You may think it's everywhere now. Oh no, man, when this first came out, you could not escape it. Everyone had a bottle and everyone was wearing it and everyone was getting compliments about it and then telling other people, bro, you got to get that new Aqua de Gio. Yeah, that new Aqua de Gio is the stuff. To this day, lots of people still call it Aqua de Gio. Yeah, it's that Aqua de Gio from Giorgio Armani. This fragrance, in many ways, set the bar for just men's aquatics. You know, what you could do with them, how well they could come across, how well people uh, could receive them. And there have been a lot of fragrance companies that have tried to put things out to either directly emulate this or to compete with it. And uh, they've had differing levels of success and yet nothing has been able to topple that. Next up, a more recent-ish release, Crada Loam. The Rolly Iris Amber and Cedar, some of the notes in this fragrance. And this one took that Prada DNA and, and refined it to the point that it just blew up as this big, mass appealing success. Now, Prada Loam obviously would not exist without the fragrances that came before it from the same house. So we're talking Prada Infusion Dome, for example, or actually a number of fragrances from the Infusion line or Prada Amber Pour Homme. Without those fragrances, you wouldn't have Prada alone. They kind of directly led into this. They kind of made that whole Prada DNA a thing. But Prada Loam is the one that really, you know, captured it like lightning in a bottle and just Now some of those other fragrances had a lot of people that love them, but they didn't catch on in the same way. You know, you'd have this really dedicated fan base of those fragrances who'd be like, oh man, it's so underrated, it's so good. But then the public at large would, would just not even care. And this one has basically set the standard for the office fragrance, the modern men's office fragrance. That clean, soapy, sophisticated kind of feeling that's going to be offensive to literally no one. That's what Prada Loam is. And they just keep doing little tweaks. Each flanker that comes out, Prada Loam Low, Prada Loam Water Splash, Prada Loam Intense, you know, they just change it ever so slightly because they know that it works really well. And they're like, let's keep capitalizing, baby. Next up, the Bomb of Spice from Victor and Rolf. Look, it's got a pen and you're like, uh oh, we're armed. I see what you did there, Victor and Rolf. Pink pepper, cinnamon, tobacco, and leather. Some of the notes in this scent. And Spice Bomb, I mean, it is what it says it is. It's, it's got a lot of spice. It'd be funny if it was called Spice Bomb and then it was just flowers. But wait, that's Flower Bomb. So this one takes that spiciness and makes it once again just the, the focal point of the fragrance. Spiciness uh, across many different forms has been used in men's fragrances for um, ever. But when Spice Bomb came out, you know, it took all of these, these very warm and in your face spicy nuances and put it right at the, the front of the scent. They let that be the focal point instead of, you know, woods or or uh, aromatics or, or something like that. Now, obviously that's been done before, but when Spice Bomb came out and this stuff hit hard and everybody loved it, you know, once again, it was one of those fragrances where people have to kind of take notice. They're like, oh yeah, so they did a fragrance that, that's got a lot of spice and people like it. Hmm. I want to make money, yeah. And of course, Spice Bomb kicked off the whole Spice Bomb line, which has had many flankers, some of them really nice, and some of them terrible. Last up is Terre d'Hermes from Hermes. Now, I kind of didn't want to include this one, if I'm being honest here. I kind of whiffle waffled on it, and I was like, well, should I, should I not, should I, should I not? Uh, I ended up having to do it. Orange, vetiver, pepper, and cedar, some of the notes in this scent, and... <laughs> For me, I think Terre d'Hermes set the bar more so for Hermes than even other brands. Now, absolutely, this is one of the best modern men's scents that is very versatile and has this gentlemanly edge to it, this slightly mature edge without going you know, too far in that direction. Absolutely one of the tops if we're talking about that. And there have been fragrances that have come out from other brands that have tried to directly emulate Terre d'Hermes or have tried to be inspired by Terre d'Hermes. That has also happened. I mean, really pretty much all these fragrances 
if you drill down into it, you'll find a lot of brands that have done that. You know, they've tried to piggyback off the success of each one of these scents by doing their own twist on it. But when I say that this set the bar for Hermes, what I mean is <laughs> Hermes is kind of blessed and cursed from Terre d'Hermes because it sells so well, even now, many years later after its release, people absolutely love it. You know, they put it up on this pedestal. People worship Hermes. Oh, Terre d'Hermes, such a masterpiece. Jean-Claude Elena, oh, you're the master. But what happens now is that every time Hermes releases a fragrance that may be marketed toward men, they're going to have it compared to Terre d'Hermes. So you're gonna have lots of people who are like, oh, that new fragrance. Yeah, it's not Terre d'Hermes, is it? <laughs> it's not even close to as good as that. <laughs> now, just as an example, Age 24, which came out this year, I'm not really a fan myself, but it's not because of a comparison to Terre d'Hermes. I just, you know, I don't really like it. But when that came out, you had this knee-jerk reaction where everybody was like, yeah, this sucks because it's not Terre d'Hermes. And that's how it's gonna be, I guess, until they come out with a, a fragrance that <laughs> incorporates the Terre d'Hermes DNA some way, not a flanker, just a reimagining. I'm just kind of, I'm playing about that, but at the same time, I'm not. So Terre d'Hermes, this one absolutely is one of the shining examples of a designer fragrance with a big heaping of class that can interest people that have tons of fragrances or very few fragrances. And it, it also is gonna be something that every Hermes fragrance that's for men that comes out in the next 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years gets compared to. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for me. 10 fragrances, stunning fragrances that set the bar for other brands, I guess sometimes themselves. Thanks for hanging with me. Thanks for your support. Stay safe out there. I'll see you guys tomorrow with another fragrance video. See you later.